The film you are about to see explores the role of leadership in international disasters and conflicts. Leading Together aims to guide and assist those who might be placed in leadership positions in response to international disasters and conflicts. Leading Together provides insights into the principles that will help you prepare to deal as leaders with the multitude of agencies and issues that you will face in the field. This film examines the issues encountered firsthand by former mission leaders, non-government organisation executives, military officers, police commissioners, diplomats and others. It draws practical lessons from their hard-earned and often hard-learned experiences. Much of what you see in this film will be familiar to you. But as you will see, our leaders, prepared as they were, had to contend with competing priorities from the outset of their deployments. Vision, clear intent, strategic decision-making, collaboration and partnership, diplomacy and communication, empathy and influence, these are traits leaders must possess and display. These are huge demands and are a burden that needs to be shared. Even the best leaders are only human. This film provides inspiring examples of leaders who are willing to share honestly what they have learned and where we all need to improve. As you view this film, I encourage you to reflect on your own strengths and limitations. Take time now to identify possible self-development opportunities for your role as a leader in difficult circumstances. From my own roles in a number of crises, from Vietnam in 1975 to Bali in 2002, and my involvement in Afghanistan in more recent times, I learned a lot of lessons. One of the key lessons I learned it was when my son and I were both working on Afghanistan. I was working in Brussels, London, New York, Washington and Canberra on the complex problems of Afghanistan, and my son was a diplomat on the ground in the province of Aruzgan in Afghanistan. As I strived to establish a clear strategic perspective, he was able to keep me in close touch with what was happening on the ground. It was a real-life experience about the importance of ensuring that the strategic vision remained grounded in reality. This film has been structured into chapters that allow you either to watch it in its entirety or to view specific topics in sections. It's a resource which can support your professional development or simply provide an aid memoir. This film is about developing leadership ability. But not all of you will be the leader. That's not the point of this film. Everyone needs to understand how leaders think and what pressures they face. Everyone needs to be prepared to step into leadership shoes and everyone needs to be ready to provide advice to leaders. This film is about developing a common appreciation of the demands of adaptive leadership in situations in which everyone within a mission is called on to deal with the unexpected and the confronting. Leadership is more than simple management. That's the critical theme of this film. Leadership is about developing the relationships that mean that the result of everyone's efforts will be more than the sum of their individual parts. We need to understand that in a real crisis there has to be a leader, but that at the same time we can all lead together. There's strong evidence of an increasing number of climate-related or weather-related disasters. All the evidence is pointing to a strong upward trend, both in the Pacific and in other parts of the world. And so the cost of these natural weather-related disasters is increasing as well, both human costs but financial costs. Peacekeeping operations, by definitions, are 
transient entities. These are band-aids to help a society give it sufficient time to heal itself. But you cannot have a band-aid for 30 years. I mean, that's an impossibility. The whole global environment has changed significantly. I mean, you know, just look at globalisation of, of trade and commerce, globalisation of travel, um, yeah, globalisation of through the, the internet and, and social media. Um, all of these things are quite rapidly developing. The institutions which we have in place to deal with these and our thinking in regards to these is, is very much traditional. The environment is becoming increasingly more complex for us to deal with because there are so many different things which impact upon it and impact upon it in a very sort of short time cycle. Um, and these are some of the issues we'll have to grapple with in the future. Well, I think it's so important for us to all feel like we're there in support of something that's not us, like a national agenda for change or peace or reconciliation, because then we can slot ourselves and our strengths and our comparative advantages in together behind something that will remain after we've all gone. You land on the ground, everything's happening at once, every community is at risk, everything has to be done right away. So how you prioritize really kind of depends on what crisis rises to the top that day. In a disaster response, and there I think the first responders are trained to know what to do first. But in the more sort of complex situations, there really is such a laundry list of different things to do. And it's just so important to lower expectations, be realistic about what can be accomplished. And that's a really, really hard call to make. But I think the leaders then who end up getting more done are ones who've made those choices. Protection of civilians, first and foremost, is the responsibility of the host country. Then secondly, it is the responsibility of the peacekeeping operation. We are mandated to provide protection for civilians. This protection starts with encouraging the host state to adopt appropriate legislation, appropriate policies for respect for human rights. This is an encouragement role, facultative role, if you like. The displacement of people globally is a really major issue for all countries. You know, there is literally tens and tens and tens of millions of people. Those people normally wouldn't leave if they didn't have to. And the reason they leave is, is because it's either too dangerous or they are persecuted for whatever reason, their religion, their ethnicity, all of these different things. If there is a reduction in conflict, um, there, is, there is peace and security, then people can actually start to deal with those basic things that they need, which are, you know, the humanitarian of rule of law and good governance. Local capacity is developed as the frontline response and what that means for women as the frontline responders because usually when a crisis, particularly a disaster, happens, the people who are responsible for, for firstly saving lives uh, but also protecting assets uh, are women. And the focus is so much on protecting women as opposed to what we've been striving for over a longer period of time even is empowering women to protect themselves empowering women to make them part of the mediations and the negotiations so that they're at the table and they have a stake and they have a voice. And we see women as victims a lot more than we see them as um, empowered actors. Everyone in peacekeeping has a responsibility to think through the impact of how we do our job and how we implement our mandate on all parts of the society, women included. You're still beholden to the host nation. The host nation is going to have to drive the, drive the train, if you will, on that old metaphor. But uh, you'll have to take the clue from them and, and try to be a part of the solution without trying to be the solution. I think it's one of the key factors that we're able to, to bring together so many different independent resources, whether or not they're our membership or indeed the private sector or the, the, the NGO community, civic society and what have you, and really get them to, um, to bring to bear what they can offer a particular problem. In complex emergencies, there's, there's no room for parochialism, right? You know, every, it's all hands on deck. 
you've got a whole lot of competing interests, or competing stakeholders, and they've got all their points of view coming forward, and there is overwhelming amounts of, uh, of information and, and influence and, and people trying to get their objectives or, or achieve their outcomes. Getting people to understand what the overall picture looks like, getting to understand where they fit into it, um, but, but really getting to understand that, that the decisions and the advice and the position they need to take is what's for the good overall as opposed to them as an individual. What are the real needs? What is really happening there? And then based on that objective analysis, identify what are the strategic objectives. Okay, those are the requirements, what are we trying to do? If you're on an operation, everybody who's following you needs to know your intent. Uh, your intent is absolutely crucial uh, to the understanding of what the mission's all about. Uh, you need to be able to give your direction in the form of a vision. Uh, you go where the vision is, and essentially a vision can be uh, further defined by the plan, goals and objectives. It starts with uh, the vision of leaders and then the diplomacy uh, to kind of bring everyone together. And then the vertical coordination from the capitals to the country where the disaster occurred in the capital there where that prime minister or president and the ambassadors are all involved and that consensus around them is built up diplomatically properly at the beginning then things are much easier yes you still have all kinds of uh, challenges but it's all headed in kind of the right direction when working with international partners in a particular environment the reality is that each of us are there for our own national interests. So it's trying to reconcile all of those national interests to move forward in terms of our um, support and assistance to the particular host country. The command and control issue is critical, but it's important to identify who leads, who takes the lead, but also to be able to convince others that yes, they have a role to play within that centralized leadership, because without it, then everyone would be doing its own in a very unstructured manner. So it's critical, first of all, for the leader to be able to, to harness the competencies of the different actors in, in such a situation. And then be able to periodically uh, evaluate the actions that have been taken. What's the impact of the actions? Because a complex situation requires adaptability. Really having a sense of what it is that the people you are going to assist actually want and need uh, is probably the most important thing that we can offer. We have a tendency to offer um, assistance in programs. And those programs are based on our own capabilities, but they're not necessarily aligned with the needs of our recipients. Whenever there's an emergency, a peace operation, they take their view, oh, this is what we do, this is how we contribute. And then everyone brings their bag or basket of stuff to the conflict and say, oh, how do we fit in? I need to fit, you know, I, I want to participate, I want to engage, my organization's important, and they want to bring their stuff to that crisis. Because everybody is coming together from different parts of the, of the globe to put together this country's police this country's public security. And of course, the only way they can do that effectively is to be coordinated amongst themselves and focused amongst themselves. But then you have to convince your clients that actually this is how they want to do it as well. So it's not just a matter of having the norms and principles of rule of law and policing and so forth be inculcated amongst those who are going to do policing. It's really a matter of having these well known and um, agreed as goals in the international community at large. You're never going to encounter the perfect mission, right? I mean, by definition, it's going to be changing, adapting, complex. You need to be open-minded and you need to be able to um, adapt, you know? And also not, not always ask for permission for everything you have to do. Sometimes you have to make a decision, you know? Being able to set some intent and broad direction, use mission command as a methodology of giving guidance, but encouraging initiative, encouraging freedom of action, and helping to support those below you, 
while seeking to have a very steady conversation with your superiors so that you're always connected to the interest and intent of your own national capital, be able to translate that into the intent and direction with freedom of action for my people and do that in complement with partner agencies whose expertise I respect. No operation led by outsiders can substitute for the will of the people of the country. Simply cannot. I think one of the first things that anyone going to any context should do is, I mean, really be an anthropologist, try and understand um, the history, the culture, the institutions, the organizations of that particular place. Every place has a long history. They have ways of organizing themselves to produce food and trade food. They have ways of building and repairing buildings. Um, they have ways of educating each other, of settling disputes, um, just of organizing daily and communal life. They have to be aware of so many things. First, of course, uh, know about uh, the country, the context in which they are operating, which, of course, uh, requires a lot of consulting, listening, reading, you know, getting the right advice. Pre-deployment planning is critical, um, and it's important that it be done together. If it's a big disaster, a lot of new actors show up very, very quickly, and not just the operational actors, say, like militaries who come in to help with a relief effort, but also the political actors. So within the humanitarian space, there is a coordination system there that exists run by the Office of Coordination for Humanitarian Affairs, OCHA, the part of the United Nations. OCHA has a very good, what they call a cluster system, uh, to help manage on the humanitarian side. So food, nutrition, housing, water, health, sanitation, all that stuff. Coordinating horizontally across those groups, the traditional aid community, those uh, new actors like military police and also some bilateral aid agencies who, are, who want to play a big role. And then the politics is complicated. And then kind of the folks who are at real work in the trenches, the muddy boots. It's a very complicated coordination space. The more that you can get a handle on what's going on and who's doing what and what somebody's motivation or mission is, then I think it's easy to understand why somebody is acting in a certain way and therefore able to coordinate, cooperate and work with that counterpart. If you take that mindset, you will build interagency solutions inherently into your force and your people will be thinking ahead of you about how to resolve issues that complement the team not one aspect or element of the team. And I think that the leader demonstrating a commitment to working in an interagency environment is implicitly driving that philosophy through the organisation they lead. The most important, the coordination. But you can't coordinate uh, agencies that cannot interoperate. That means initially you must create that interoperability capability and through exercising. You need to be prepared. Uh, and how are you prepared? In many ways, you need to practice before you do. It's a very difficult thing to do. In fact, the nature of our professional careers makes it very difficult to practice, particularly for operational roles. That's where we think that involving people in exercise programs is increasingly important. Training and education really important at the leadership level, you know, the mid-level leadership, company commander, brigade commander, because they set the tone. I mean, they set the tone as the whole team is going over there as to what they're, what, how they're going to, to in interact. It's very important as an individual that you know, where do I operate the best and where does my skill set rest? And some people do have the span of ability to be able to work across all of those facets from 
high ambiguity, high response, quick decision making, um, through to very structured and organised approach in having the fundamentals in place and building on those fundamentals. What capacities and competences do they bring to the table? And then what role are they going to play? The leader must understand. Where do they fit in? It's like a wheel. Where in the wheel do they fit? So that the wheel runs smoothly. Culture is incredibly important. The sort of culture I like is a people culture, a people culture defined by, uh, by values, one which really emphasises uh, teamwork and collaboration. But what would be my advice if I walked into any country? I think my advice would be as follows. First and foremost, be humble. Do not assume that as SRSG you know everything. Leaders, until they are humble and willing to learn, willing to listen, they cannot be good leaders. In fact, uh, I think uh, listening leaders are more important than talkative leaders. As a leader coming in, whether you have the experience or you don't have the experience, it's critical when you first step in to realize that uh, you are, you're not in charge, you're there to support somebody, uh, that their needs, they'll help to articulate those to you. And sometimes it's difficult not to be in charge, but eh, a little bit of humility, a little bit of realization, of, and a lot of, uh, a lot of training and a lot of change has taken place. I have great optimism for this because I've seen 20 years of change in this area. There is a huge number of people and organizations and agencies and military and uh, different disaster management authorities who are there at the time of the crises. But then when it really comes to a point at which it's time to, to use the phrase that we often use of building back better, uh, they're not necessarily there. And it's in that period where we really can get ready for uh, the next event. And if we get ready properly, the next event might not be a disaster. To what extent is a certain operation military versus political, diplomatic, economic? It obviously varies by whatever the, the, the mission is. And you have to sort of have a lot more awareness of not just that there are political parts and military parts, but how do they actually work together? I mean, what does that mean? It's like we, we talk about it, but we don't actually really integrate it. You need a robust, interactive, iterative dialogue with all the players um, at the table so that it doesn't just devolve to, well, how many boots on the ground or are there going to be boots on the ground? I believe in the critical importance, you know, we call it C2, command and control, that is the military concept. But I have my own uh, version. I call it C4. And the C4 is communication, 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 and communication. If you achieve that, I think, broadly speaking, things will be better and right. And that is the responsibility of the leader. They have to think day in and day out how they are going to communicate, what the example they are going to give, when they are going to give a particular message, how they are going to give the message, because the delivery of the message, the content of the message, the timing of the message, all are important for ultimate impact on the recipient. In terms of high technology, this is leading to a greater concern and interest in information sharing on the ground so all the partners can uh, collect and share information and get it to the responders very quickly. I think a lot can be said for the efforts made by our so-called digital humanitarian community, working with social media and uh, downrange capabilities that we just couldn't have imagined 10 or 15 years ago. Adding to the complication now is the participation of many more actors in the information space. And so that has great advantages, but also disadvantages in terms of quality of information, managing the volume of information, having standards for how we will define the information requirement. It's a big challenge for leadership at the outset of an operation to figure out how to channel, 
different types of information. I have always appreciated senior operators who came in with a let's err on the side of unclassified, generally available, set up something called an all partners area network to share the information. Uh, recognizing there may be information that needs to be kept on a separate track. Communication is so important. And of course, it should be the leaders of the country themselves who communicate to the public in their own languages. But in general, um, being able to communicate truthfully and quickly and clearly about what's going on then provides the clarity, the transparency, and then can help generate the confidence that there is a plan and there's a future that people can trust. We, the UN or, or the Australian government or some other government, can get their messages out there, but those messages don't resonate with the people we want them to resonate with. If you look at, at social media, from an institutional sense, our messages are quite complex, um, but from a terrorism point of view, you know, those messages are quite simple. And to me, that's the real challenge. It's, it's not the vehicle, it's the messaging and, and why people are interested and actually really listen to that message and it gets traction. Handling the media is a real challenge. The need to be balanced and measured. You're not just talking to a bunch of journalists, you're talking um, you're actually talking to the world and out there in the world are the, the families that have been, have had their lives ruined uh, by the disaster that you're managing. The traditional way of doing communications for peace operations is essentially one-way communications. 21st century style of communications is, is really quite circular. It's about building a dialogue rather than simply getting across points. It requires giving up control of the message. And that shift is one that our new leadership needs to be very fluent in. The idea of your constituency being a digital one. Your message will be changed and distorted and uh, will be parroted back to you in ways that you would never have imagined. I think one of the hallmarks of a modern deployment is the, the criticality of communications. And that the providing timely, accurate, and impartial information responsibility of leadership is no longer a, a optional choice, it's, it's a requirement. Modern peace operations leadership needs to be able to communicate directly to local populations. But this is a responsibility, right? It's not just doing it, it's explaining it. And explaining not just what you're gonna do, but what you won't do. And that, in terms of expectations management, from my perspective, is a critical aspect of mission success in a modern peace operation. The great value about diversity is it brings to a problem solutions that you as an individual haven't thought of. And so you can only leverage the different views and ideas, the perspectives of uh, a wide range of people, if you're open to that. Bringing diverse groups together with competing agendas and different perspectives means that there's got to be some compromise and, and you really got to have an open mind as to how you can work through that and look for, for what the best outcome is. And that sometimes may not be your outcome. In many instances, people were working across purposes. There was a very limited understanding of how the UN operates in response. Very little respect at times about what government's expectations and needs might be. And often um, the civilian or NGO side simply saw the, the military as, as a problem that needed to be managed rather than a potential capability that could support that, the efforts. I would say over the last 10 years and looking at the recent sort of response we've had in Vanuatu and in the Nepal earthquake, it is much more of a hand in glove approach and there's much more of a respect of where people come from. So there's a lot of diplomacy involved. It's not just a technical thing about, oh, how many people need water or shelter. It's a very um, uh, important diplomatic process. If you don't go through those initial stages of conflict analysis and setting the objectives and doing the diplomatic work to generate the consensus around them, then it's just chaos on the ground. The international aid response is proscribed frequently by what it is that we've been asked to do, not necessarily what on the ground is required. In some ways, you could argue that we're, we're supply-driven, not demand-driven. That's why the point of coordination is so important. The military should be seen as an asset 
of ultimate civilian political objectives. How you use that asset depends upon the relationship which exists between the civil and the military component. The military is often the tip of the spear, right, when the international community goes in. They're the first responders. Um, but the problem is that most countries really need policing. They don't necessarily need a robust military, and in fact, a robust military ultimately can be a threat to the government in the long term. Leaders of police components in peace operations need to think in terms of their local counterparts ultimately and currently being in charge of their own destiny. You can only do so much from the outside, the rest has to come from internal sources. NGOs play an enormously important role, often have a long history with the communities in the, in the country, which others are working, and bring in an enormous amount of knowledge of capability and so on to the table. At the same time, sometimes the coordination issue of who's doing what where and the same organizations are going to the same village to fund the same things, it can become very confusing and sometimes counterproductive. So there's an enormous need to be very sensitive to this and find imaginative ways of finding the right ways to bring more coherence where appropriate and collaboration where appropriate. For corporate actors in an affected country where a lot of their employees are victims, there's always going to be an incentive, an understandable need to contribute. From the public standpoint, uh, there always has to be a clear communication to private actors that there cannot be any presumption of privileged access. Particularly in a crisis situation and particularly in disaster recovery and relief, I think you should use every, everything available to you. And yeah, that means that you'll have to put some safeguards into place and you'll have to be aware that um, you know, there are equities that people have. The more that the country can help will take the lead on designing the policy framework, the priorities, the short-term actions, and then the medium long-term recovery and response, and make sure that they can own it, they can articulate it to the people in their country, and they have the legal responsibility to, and then find the means of partnership. There's no case that I've come across where that wouldn't be a good idea. Once you have a whole of the government approach to things, you get much, much better outcomes uh, because you're able to call on all of the different skills that are arrayed before you. And with all those skill sets, you have all of the uh, competencies and capabilities that you need to deal with any given set of circumstances. New thinking is necessary. It has to be thinking that is grounded in realities of fundamental challenges. And they may be demographic, political, environmental, geographic, and so forth, but new thinking. And I suspect early on when planning uh, a mission or in the early days, a leader ought to be pushing more demanding more for innovation and new thinking because if left to simply take the satisfactory or the comfortable that is probably a pathway uh, to continued policy failure. Today we are dealing with uh, essentially groups within a country, intrastate, which implies uh, more policing, which implies more uh, strengthened efforts to ensure that uh, there is development of local capacities. But it also implies that we are dealing with the unfortunate developments, like, for example, while we are not an anti-terrorist outfit, but we deal in situations, we work in situations where terrorism operates alongside us. So you talk of technology, but we have to keep abreast with technology in order to avert the disasters which uh, these terrorists can actually inflict upon us. What history shows us is we have to keep a, an open mind to what peacekeeping needs to be. And 10 years ago, we thought it was one thing. In five years, it might need to be something else. 
what we have seen in the disaster response area is much more attention going on into disaster risk reduction. The other ways that we've seen this move forward is the adoption of the resilience agenda by many governments and foundations, um, seeing ways that countries, again, can mitigate risk, can build their resilience to withstand shocks and to anticipate them and prevent them. I view this more in positive than negative terms, but if you look globally around the world, I would say the welcome mat for international relief aid is declining. There is a higher interest in regional self-reliance, national and regional self-reliance, to do things within and among regions. So you don't have to get a huge outside influx of well-intentioned assistance. We're building the regional pillars of global stability, both in terms of the disaster preparedness as well as the conflict response. We continue, I guess, having had a traditional model of response internationally, we've shifted to an internal response and local government stability uh, and reinstating law and order within a country. So that's a, a quite a different environment because it takes a long time to rebuild those capabilities. Why wait for exhaustion of capacity? Uh, we should be able to bring in when we realize that we are already operating at 80% of the capacity, so therefore it is likely to be overwhelmed in the near future. That is the time to bring in additional capacities rather than to wait for complete exhaustion of capacities and then it is impossible for the civilians to do the work as also for the military to do its work. I do think we need to look again at how um, delivery systems can be made much more efficient and there are ways to do things cheaper, better, faster, <laughs> or maybe at least two of those three. And this is where new technologies hold such promise. We have in all of our missions a best practice officer, we call them. So they're kind of our reach into the missions to learn what they're doing on the ground. So we've got quite an excellent database now of all kinds of feedback from the most minute technical area of logistics through to high level political engagement and so on. So it's kind of live, horizontal sharing of information across the missions. I believe in leadership by example, whereby uh, you work tirelessly for the welfare of your people. And if you do that, they'll follow you to the ends of the earth, particularly if you empower them. You've really got to sort of trust your own judgment, um, have confidence in the things that you learnt for many, many, many years um, and use that as a basis to move forward. If we're not prepared to sort of exercise judgment in taking informed risk, um, then the, the situation gets away from us. I mean, one of the things I've found over the years which has served me well in, in all the different roles is the ability to self-reflect and learn personally from involvement in any of these situations. Reflect personally, reflect upon the environment, reflect upon what others have said and done and how they've reacted so that you know, we can get better at what we do. Because if we don't, um, as the world moves on, if we keep doing things the same way, we become more and more out of touch as opposed to more and more in touch. Mm -hmm.